So before we begin our lesson today on soil and agriculture, I'd like for you to stop and think about your prior conceptions about these topics. So take a few moments and answer these questions. What do you already know about soil? What is its composition like? And what factors affect its formation? So it's spring here and a lot of us are at home. So it's the perfect time to tend to a garden and grow some plants. Before you do, it's helpful to know a few things about soil. This will help us bridge from our previous units on the lithosphere and the hydrosphere into our new unit on the biosphere. So to begin with, soil is a loose mixture of small mineral fragments, organic matter, water, and air that can support the growth of vegetation. It is ultimately formed by the weathering of rock. So why is soil important? Well, first of all, it provides nutrients to plants, and we get our energy from plants, and so do other animals. Soil is a house for many animals. For example, the mole here, um, it survives in um, the soil underground. Soil also helps to store water, as we learned about last unit, with groundwater. So how does soil develop? Well, first of all, soil isn't a single homogeneous thing. It has horizons, which are these different layers that extend down into the earth, and they each have different properties that depend on how deep they are. The topsoil at the top is rich in nutrients and people need it for farming. The topsoil is rich with a substance called hummus. Different from the chip dip, hummus is decayed organic matter, which is very rich in minerals, um, which can help plants grow. At the bottom of the soil horizon is the bedrock, which is the ultimate source of parent rock. It's not weathered very much. That's what the, the higher layers are for. Soil develops due to a number of factors. The organisms that live there determine how the hummus forms. The topography of the location will affect the soil too. For example, mountain soil is generally of poor quality because water rushes down and takes away a lot of the nutrients. How long the soil has been forming affects how thick each of the profiles are. The original parent material, those are the rock and mineral fragments that make up the soil, those determine the color, how permeable, and the different chemical properties of the soil. And finally, we'll be talking about this more in our next video, climate. The average temperature and rainfall influences the weathering rate of the soil. Soil is the minerals in soil are composed of three different um, main types of particles. The proportions of these different particles determines the texture of the soil, how easy it is to break up, how consistent the soil is, and also how permeable the soil is to air and water, how quickly those can infiltrate down through the soil. The biggest of these particles is sand, which is about zero, which is two millimeters, down to about 50 microns. From 50 microns to two microns is silt, which is very, very small. And then the smallest particle is anything less than two microns, which is considered clay. In order to characterize soil, we use the soil triangle here. So the way the triangle works, it essentially has three axes. For example, we have clay on the left, silt on the right, and then sand at the bottom. So all we have to do to use this triangle is to take one of the proportions. So for example, if we take sand and graph a line at 20% sand, we also know there's 50% silt, so we'll graph a line there, and you see how it starts at the 50 mark and goes along that line there. And if there's 20% silt, or sorry, 20% sand, 
and 50% silt, that means the rest of it has to be made up by clay. So if you know two, you get the third composition proportion for free. So we know there's 30% clay. Let's draw a line there. And that will help us to classify the composition of our soil. We could consider this either clay loam or silty clay loam because it lies along the boundary there. And loam isn't its own substance. Loam is a combination of clay, silt, and sand. Usually you want a uh, nice loamy soil in order to grow uh, plants, although different plants would prefer sandy soil, uh, like leeks, for example, but others prefer silty or clay type soil. So this is a very important um, diagram that you should be able to use. So to help you practice with this, here is a stop and think question. Try figuring out what the category of soil texture this sample would be here if you have 20% clay, 40% silt, and 40% sand. Soil has a couple other properties that we're interested in too. First of all, it's its fertility. The soil fertility is its ability to hold nutrients. This property comes from the parent rock and the hummus. What those were each composed of will tell you which minerals plants will have available to them. Plants care about having three main minerals, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. These will be in a lot of potting soils, you'll find, although they need other um, different minerals too, like calcium, iron, manganese, as we see here. This guide will help you determine what your plant might be lacking um, if you can uh, notice what might be wrong with it. So in addition to fertility, we also care about the pH of our soil. You've probably heard the term pH before. That refers to how acidic or basic something is. For example, lemon juice is very acidic. It has a sour taste to it. Whereas more basic substances um, will taste more bitter. Um, bleach is coming to mind as an example basic substance, although please do not drink bleach, it is very toxic. So the pH of a soil affects how accessible certain nutrients are. And so different plants will have preferences for what types of soil they'll want to live in. For example, um, the plant uh, hydrangeas, those will actually change their color depending on what soil they're in. However, soil is a important resource and it can be damaged or lost over time. If you deplete the soil, this can lead to a process called desertification, where grasslands can become desert, or a lot of the soil can be kicked up and blown away into the air, as happened during the Dust Bowl, as we see in that picture to the left. Soil damage and loss can be caused by overgrazing, where too many um, animals that eat grass can um, eat away at the plants which hold the soil down. Overusing soil uh, due to agriculture can deplete the nutrients from it, making it more difficult to grow future crops there. But erosion is the main mechanism that transports soil from one location to another. Wind, water, ice, and gravity can all move the soil particles around. So roots, plants in the ground, help protect the topsoil. And if you deforest a region, that can remove the protection. Finally, in addition to, use, to planting too many things over and over again in one patch of soil, leaching due to rain can also bring very valuable nutrients from the topsoil down to lower layers as the water carries it even deeper into the ground. So now that we know a bit about the very basics of soil science, let's learn about some agricultural methods and how the traditional methods can lead to damage and soil loss, while more sustainable methods can help preserve the soil for future crops.
So traditional methods like slash and burn, clear cutting, tillage, monoculture, and overusing fertilizers, um, those can result in a lot of bad things. So in slash and burn, the cutting and burning of plants in forests or woodlands is used to create fields, but this also destroys the native vegetation is there. Clear cutting is the process by which huge tracts of land, most or all of the trees in an area, are uniformly cut down. In the process of tilling, the land is prepared um, to grow crops by digging, stirring, and overturning the soil, which makes it more susceptible to erosion. Monoculture is the process by which a single crop is grown year after year in a wide area. This can deplete the soil of a single nutrient that that particular plant needs to survive. And then finally, traditional farming methods overuse a lot of fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, and insecticides, which can be run off by water and gather into nearby bodies of surface water or into uh, rivers, which can go downstream and harm the aquatic ecosystems there. So in order to help preserve the soil and the nearby ecosystems, people have developed a variety of sustainable methods. First of which is contour plowing. As we see in the bottom right, in this process, cultivated rows run sideways rather than up and down. This slows down water erosion. In terracing on the bottom left, these step-like ridges are built and arranged sideways on a hill. This also slows down water erosion. In no-till farming, instead of digging up the land and making it susceptible to wind erosion, you only plant and spray very carefully uh, water on the plant spots, leading to less disruption. In crop rotation, instead of planting the same crop year after year, you grow different crops on the same piece of land and rotate your different fields around. This uh, catches soil eroded from other crops and replenishes the soil nutrients. Finally, to also mitigate wind erosion, farmers have used windbreaks or shelter belts, which are rows of trees that are planted close together. This helps force the wind movement upwards away from the ground. In order to use these sustainable methods, we have to consider three different variables magnitude, duration, and frequency. These will help us to know how effective the sustainable practice will be. The magnitude is the size, extent, or importance of a technique. The duration is how long you continue to use the technique. And then finally, the frequency is how many times you use the technique. To finish off today, I'd like for you to stop and think again. Please take a few moments and create another technique that farmers could use to help conserve their soil. Briefly describe why it would protect the soil. This is all I have for today about soil and agriculture. Next time, we'll be beginning our unit on the biosphere in earnest. Have a good day.